Lord, we ask Spirit that you would just speak through her and help us to be receptive to what you want to say to us individually and corporately. Lord, just bless Marion as she outputs now. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Give Marion a round of applause. So thank you for your welcome here today. and It's been really good to be part of um, this church here at Greenford for the first nearly two and a half weeks um, through on Wednesday. And uh, I've been able to get to know some of you, some of your stories. And uh, it's been a real privilege to receive me um, as a Moreland student. I'm in my third year now. And um, I hope that what I've prepared today will speak to each one of your hearts today. So I pray, we pray that our hearts will be open. And um, I uh, the passage I've chosen to start with is from Numbers chapter 13. I don't know if any of you have your Bibles. Um, we'll have up on the screen the NLT, although um, I've used the NIV during my preparation. So it's Numbers chapter 13, and it's beginning at verse 17. Can everyone hear me all right? Or do I need yes. to yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'll start. <coughs> so Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. He said, go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good? or bad? Do their towns have walls? Or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. It happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob, near Libo Hamath. Going north, they passed through the Negev and arrived at Hebron, where Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, all descendants of Anak, lived. The ancient town of Hebron was founded seven years before the Egyptian city of Zoan. When they came to the valley of Eshkol, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, so large that it took two of them to carry it on a pole between them. They also brought back samples of the pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol, which means cluster. Because of the cluster of grapes, the Israelite men cut there. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. <coughs> but the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we travelled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. 
All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants. They're the, they're the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. So may the word of the Lord speak to us as I speak to you. And may we think about that situation. I'm just going to put this Bible down here because it's um, easier. I've got my notes. I don't know if it's clear. Sorry, I have the, uh, the passages written down. So thinking about that passage, I'd like just to read a small passage from the New Testament, first of all, from the first letter of John, chapter 4, verse 18. And this chapter says, this verse says, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out, drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So let us consider for a moment the children of Israel. They were commanded to go ahead with the Lord they were commanded to teach and observe in the land that they're crossing to possess. And so, and so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commandments that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. The Lord wanted them to fear him. He wanted them to keep the law that he'd given to them. He wanted them to observe the law. He wanted them to be with him all the time as they journeyed forward. And it says in Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. So fear in its correct content Context, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life and can be a fountain of life for us. But what happens in our life, we all have fears at some point, don't we? That's human nature. I'm sure each one of you can think of different fears that you're going through at the moment or you've had throughout your life. But you know, these are worldly fears that do not point to God. And these fears are part of our own insecurities as human beings. Maybe we haven't taken the plunge for a job because we think maybe we're not good enough. Maybe we can't do all that it entails. We've got fear of going on holiday. My mum had never ever flown and my dad had an appointment and he wanted to be a pastor on an island. And my mum said, I'm not going because we have to fly there. And then my dad got another job come up on another island in the same area. And there was a boat going there. And my mum just knew, yeah, that's the one to go to. But my dad waited for my mum. We have fear sometimes, don't we, to prevent us from what God wants us to do. But maybe we've had a bad experience in our lives. And we are fearful of that experience happening again. And so we don't go that way anymore. Or perhaps a role or ministry in the church where we said that that's not for me, I'm not qualified enough. Perhaps what we've done in the past has been ridiculed. And so we don't step over the line again to offer our services in that way. <coughs> Even though we are Christians and we have that assurance that Jesus has done a transforming work in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, at different points in our lives, these fears rise in us and prevent us from doing what God wants us to do. Usually as Christians, this panic and fear comes in when we take our focus away from God and his promises. I know sometimes... We get so engrossed. I know with my studies, even at college, it's a Christian college. 
and I've been so engrossed in trying to get the essays done that sometimes the act of doing the academic work can take your focus of what the Lord really wants you to do and wants to say. And that's the same for all of us. We have busy lives, we have busy jobs, we get engrossed with our home life, with our children, running them to school and back. And sometimes the Lord and the, our focus on him, the study of the scriptures, gets pushed out to a minimum in our lives. And it happens to each of us. But we have to remember, we have to pull, pull ourselves back and say, Lord, what is it you want me to give up? What is it? When is it you want me to have this space with you so that I can put myself on the right track again? The passage that I read earlier, right at the beginning, in the book of Numbers, speaks about the first plan that God had for the children of Israel to enter the promised land. The beginning of Numbers, Moses... Um, <coughs> At the beginning of Numbers, Moses had the Lord's instructions. He had to take a census of all the people in every tribe and had strategically organised the 12 tribes into a military camp, preparing them for the journey to the Promised Land. This was two years after the Exodus. God's signs helped them with their decisions. When the cloud descended on the tabernacle, they rested. And when the cloud ascended and was moving, so they continued with their journey. And everything was clear, and that's the way that they went forward. Everything started off well. And when the people started complaining, even though the Lord provided manna for them, they started to yearn for what they used to have. They wanted the melons and leeks and other fruit from Egypt. But why did they leave Egypt? They were slaves there. They were under a lot of hardship. But they'd forgotten about this hardship. They just looked at the good things and wanted to turn back. They didn't want to face the future. In number, Numbers 12, even Moses' own blood brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, complained against him for having an Ethiopian wife. Sometimes our own family can be a stumbling block to us, can't they? For us going forward with the Lord. But anyway, here we have it, the cloud settled in the wilderness of Paran, and the time came as it was in those days to spy out the land in chapter 13. And the spies were told, the 12, uh, 12 people were chosen and they were to go out into the land. Was it fertile or barren? What were the people like? What was the produce like? What was the camps like, or was it cities? Were they fortified cities? And it took them 40 days to go and explore the land. And they bought brat back good things from that land. They bought brat pomegranates, figs, grapes. They reported back to the people back at, in Kadesh, in the wilderness of Paran, about the people in the land, that they were strong, they had fortified cities that they were a very tall race and they told the reality of the situation to the people. However, we have one verse in this which is the key. It's verse 30. It says, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. Caleb had this vision he had the strength of the Lord, he was with the Lord, and he knew, in spite of all the obstacles in Canaan, that it was right to go forward. He had that voice of assurance and authority of the way. Caleb and Joshua were willing to follow the Lord their God, even through the way ahead, and they knew that the way ahead was going to be tough. But they knew that God had promised them that they would be going into the land of milk and honey that he'd promised them. And he would be with them all the way. Their trust in the Lord was certain and sure. But what happened to the ten remaining spies? What happened to the ten remaining spies? They, the, 12, the twelve spies went out 
and the 12 spies came back. Joshua and Caleb were ready to go forward, but the 10 spies said, we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. They were afraid and started to think in their own strength and not in the Lord's strength. They'd taken their focus off the Lord, they'd taken their focus off the vision, and they felt like little tiny grasshoppers against these great big giants. And they didn't want to go forward. They were afraid. And they spread their fear amongst the whole congregation of the, of the people of Israel that were there. When I first came back to England, uh, after working overseas for many years, I was fearful of driving. I'm much more confident now, but I had to go on to the M4 after I had a driving license before I went away, and when I came back, I hadn't driven for maybe seven or eight years, and I had to go on to the motorway. And I was scared. To be perfectly honest, I was frightened of all this traffic weaving in and out. And, uh, but it went on. It wasn't just the first day, it was the second day and the third day, and it went on for a few weeks. And then somebody said to me, why do you drive as if everyone else on the road is more powerful and better than you? Everyone. Is that true? No. And what I needed to do was to ask God into the situation to be with me as I drove. Sometimes we can see ourselves as grasshoppers, can't we? We can go in timidly, we can walk fearfully, and we can see everyone else ten times better than us. We can see everyone else, oh, they've got a degree, they've got whatever, they've got the experience. We can make every excuse because we think that we're grasshoppers and they're giants. And, you know, I had to, and over quite a few things since coming back from the mission field, I've had to lay down this fear of different things bit by bit. Because I realised that it was my own insecurity that was allowing me to be fearful and not allowing me to be strong and true to God's promises. That he's the one that we need to invite, to ask, to heal us from this and to strengthen us and to empower us to do his will. When these um, spies came back and they started to spread fear amongst the congregation, it's like when the Apostle Paul refers to yeast. You know what yeast does? Yeast makes bread, doesn't it? You put it in to make the bread expand. And the yeast is in the right condition, it has to be warm, a little bit of sugar, put it in the airing cupboard, or whatever you do with it. And gradually, you see the dough expand and expand. Well, that's for a good thing to eat, you know, to have good bread and to get the yeast right. But you know, yeast in the Bible is referred to quite often as sin. You know, they had to take yeast out of the Passover bread, didn't they? And, um... Paul refers to that at one point in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, that we have to get rid of that yeast, that sin in our lives, which spreads to other people. You know, the fear of these spies that came back, they spread to the whole congregation, and the whole congregation became fearful, up to the point when they wanted to stone Moses and Aaron and Caleb and Joshua. So we have to be careful of that. We have to keep our focus on the Lord. We have to keep our focus on his promises. We have to be sure that we're following him and not to look at our own self and uh, put our sights in ourselves and in other people. When we move on to chapter 14 of Numbers, we realise that these ten spies who started to look by sight fed an if-only mentality among the people. 
Have you heard of that word? How often have you said, if only? Yeah? If only we were still in Egypt and had the good fruit in Egypt. If only we'd have died in the desert because they didn't want to face the future. I know someone has said to me before, has tatted before, and I've said, if only. And I thought, what's, why, why? It's just a matter of, of conversation, a matter of saying something. But now I realise, as I was studying this, that they even used it. They used it for bad, uh, for evil in the um, Old Testament. And they used that word, if only we had had or remained with what we had before. They then wanted to turn against Moses and choose a leader to take them back to Egypt. They didn't even want Moses anymore. He wasn't good enough. God had showed mercy and love all the way through these times. He provided for them and had made a covenant with them. And then they said, well, why should our wives and victims die by the sword, become victims and die by the sword? And the people wanted to stone their current leaders. But do you know what happened at that point? That Moses and Aaron, they fell down on their faces. And Caleb and Joshua, they tore their clothes in front of the people. They were in despair. They were angry. They knew what the guidance of the Lord was, but the rest had fallen by the wayside. In Numbers 14, 17 to, uh, 7 to 9, it says, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. This is what uh, Caleb said, Joshua said. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone. But the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. They held firm. They knew that it was right to go forward. Caleb and Joshua feared God, not men. And because of their assurance that God was leading them onwards into the promised land, they knew that he would help them conquer all that was ahead of them. And we can too. However, in Numbers 14, we realise that also God was not going to grant favour to the children of Israel. <coughs> and said that no one over 22 years of age would enter the promised land, except for who? Except for who? Joshua, Joshua and Caleb. They were the only two that were going to go into the promised land. And they had to wait 40 years before the next entry was made, 40 years. Sometimes if we grumble against God, if we take our eyes off him, we will lose what he has for us. And we will have to wait until a long time for that restoration to take place. We need to be sure, we need to be sure of his direction, we need to be sure of his calling, we need to be sure of his work in our lives. And in verse 9 it says, In this wilderness your bodies will fall, every one of you, twenty years old or more, who was counted in the census and who was grumbled against me. He won't enter. The people were looking back and they no longer believed that God would carry them through. They had forgotten about the cloud ascending and descending, about the protection of fire by night, the provision of manna, the quails and water and they now had to wait 40 years before they were able to cross over to the promised land. They wanted what they had before. I'm sure they didn't want the slavery, they'd forgotten about the slavery. But fear had sprang about, spread among them and everything in the past suddenly seemed better. It's always green on the other side, isn't it? It's always much greener. <coughs> Often when things are going well at work 
at home, at church, we can see God's love and faithfulness and are urged to move forward. But when the going starts to get tough, when challenges are faced, God often gets pushed to one side and we jump back into our worldly bodies and start to see the situation by sight and not by the faith that God can give us and the way through that situation. In Luke 9, uh, Jesus was walking alongside some men. They said, we want to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus reminds them of the cost. Because they, one of them said, let me bury my father first. The other says, let me say goodbye to my family. Jesus' answer was clear. No one who puts his hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. They're quite strong words, aren't they? But what, what he's saying is that we need to focus, we need to look forward, we need to keep going. If we look back, what happens when, when, if we push a plough up and we face backwards? The furrows will go like that, won't they? Because we don't really know the direction we're going in. But when we look ahead to the horizon, two years ahead, three years ahead, or whatever. We keep going with the promises that God has given to us. Okay, they might change along the way, but if we keep close to him, he will show us clearly the direction he wants us to go in. The plan ahead maybe have been a bit scary for Caleb and Joshua, but they were assured of God's plan. They knew, and they knew if they kept faithful to him, he would, sit, he would guide them. It is difficult to focus on the present and future if we are always looking at the past. It's not wrong to build on the experiences of the past, but if we hold on to the past and wish it was our reality now, we won't move forward. We need to be able to get on that journey of eternal life to move forward into eternity, the way that Jesus wants us to go. I've come to that challenge again. I'm now 58 and uh, there's been challenges all the way through. We have challenges, don't we? At first I thought, shall I go abroad? I don't want to leave my mum or my dad and my sisters and my friends. And then the Lord finally caused me to go abroad as a missionary. And now I've come back Sometimes I look back and think, oh, I wish I was abroad. <laughs> but, you know, I've got to lay it down. I've got to uh, lay it down so that I can look ahead because I know that the Lord has called me to work in ministry in this country, in the UK, at this time. And if I don't lay down what's gone in the past, I won't be able to move forward into the future. And maybe that's happened to some of us. We've moved from other countries. Maybe we're thinking about going back to another country. I don't know what your plan is. But there's always something we have to lay down. There's always a cost, isn't there, of laying down and moving. Sometimes the excitement of going is one thing. But when we've been like two or three months, we realise the reality. And then our mind starts to, to think of things maybe we shouldn't, but we have to keep focusing. What is the reason the Lord brought me to this point? And what is the reason, what is his plan for me, for now and into the future? We have to let go, don't we? We have to let go of everything, lay it down, and ask him what it is he wants us to take hold of in our lives. I will close, um, in a moment, and I will close with the passage we started from, from 1 John 4, 17 to 21. You might want to put it up. Or 18, it's got there. So this is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. We will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love dries out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. To know and understand our journey forward, 
We have to be in that perfect will of God. That's our salvation, isn't it? Remember back, or I'll ask us earlier to think back about how the Lord had saved us. And he saves us not just for that moment, but it's a journey, isn't it? The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit works through us day by day by day. As we become perfected in him, as we move forward with him, as we're changed by him, moulded by him, and he will lead us on the journey ahead. When Joshua and Jacob finally crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land, 40 years later, they were given the following words from the Lord their God. The Lord said, be strong and courageous. You all know this verse, I expect, and many of you know this verse. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Of course, we don't keep the law, do we? But we've got the scriptures. We need to follow Jesus. We need to be looking at what the scriptures say to us today. And we need to meditate on it day and night so that we will have that assurance of the way forward. There are many things which hold us back from loving God fully and serving as Jesus would serve in the world. And this holding back will be different for each person. It might be holding onto, the, onto past experiences, whether good or bad. It's maybe holding on to people that should have been let go of years ago. Maybe a boyfriend or a, a bad experience that we've had. Perhaps we're holding on because we haven't forgiven someone. Perhaps we really hate or dislike somebody in our hearts. That will prevent us from moving forward. That prevents us from fully having the love of God within us. Sometimes we've got habits. We know what they are. Different habits that prevent us from moving forward with God. And we cling tightly to them because they have a hold on us. So I thought this morning if the, uh, if the band could play and uh, we would have a just play some bit very quietly and um, if you can and if you could all shut your eyes and just reflect for a few moments on maybe what it is that's holding you back when going forward in your life we do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation to learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.